and hello to everyone and thank you for joining us. I'm Graciela and I'm the coordinator for IPE Foundations, which is an interprofessional course at OHSU. We will tell you more about it when we start. Our presentation is based on our experiences going online this past spring term with this course. I've been teaching higher ed courses for over 20 years and I'm now coordinating this course at OHSU, which is uh, Oregon Health and Science University. I have a master's degree in applied linguistics and a master's in instructional design. I'm gonna let Toby introduce herself. Hi, I'm Toby Jones and I'm the course director for the IPE Foundations course that we're going to be talking with you all about today. I'm also the director for interprofessional education at OHSU's School of Dentistry and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Restorative Dentistry, which is really just a fancy way of saying that I'm a dentist who teaches future dentists to be dentists. <laughs> so uh, by the end of the session, we hope you will be able to apply Maslow's hierarchy of needs to guide actions in online education, explain the concept of care and education, and create a personal plan to show diverse students that you care. Um, so the course Toby directs and that I coordinate is called Interprofessional Education slash Foundations, as it is a foundational IPE course at OHSU. Without going into too much detail that will not be relevant for this talk, um, I will tell you that this course is required for most first year students, which include students from the School of Dentistry, School of Medicine, um, physician assistant program, uh, the nutrition and dietetics program, the radiation therapy program, medical physics programs, many, many students, right? School of nursing uh, in the local campuses and the medical lab scientists and emergency medical technician programs that are joint partnerships between uh, OIT and OHSU and second year students uh, of pharmacy. Uh, and this is a, de a joint a degree uh, that is a joint collaboration between OHSU and OSU. Um, this course is uh, somewhat blended usually. Uh, there are three um, in-person sessions and two intersessions uh, with teamwork where the students really engage with each other mostly online because they're all over campus and some not necessarily in Portland. Um, we have over 600 students in this course and more than 100 facilitators that help us each of the sessions, uh, the in-person sessions. Uh, one course director, Toby, uh, one coordinator, me. And so with all these 600 students, we divide, we divide them into 50, about 52 groups uh, of about 12 to 15 students per group to make it more manageable. And within each of those groups, there's different teams of three to four students. So overall, we have about 240 teams. Um, and the changes need to be approved by the full IPE committee. Um, so that's what it normally is. And this is what the, the, how the course normally works. Now, COVID happened. And just like many of you, we had to quickly change uh, to fully online course delivery. And this left us with one full session, the spring session that still needed to be done, but this time online. Um, it was um, previously scheduled for April the 8th, and we still had those many students, but we were left with only 12 daring uh, facilitators um, who agreed to help us a month before the session, even though we couldn't tell them yet at the time you know exactly how we were going to do it because we still didn't know how we were going to do it we were still planning it right and so they did know though it was not going to be synchronous so they knew that much they were true heroes uh, they were wonderful we initially decided after meeting with the committee that we would not do it synchronously and um 
Yeah, but we will still try to do it or make it happen on April the 8th as that time spot is protected by all the programs in school so that students can attend foundations in person. So we thought we'll try to keep it the same way. So we also decided um, uh, that with the committee that we will continue to use our LMS, which is Sakai for managing this online session. And as budget was limited and we didn't really have time to explore other options. Um, however, on further conversations with the Sakai um, support team, we realized that Sakai would most likely, would most likely crash if we wanted all students to upload their materials on the same day or even the same week and participate in forums on the same day. So we decided to spread out the work over almost three weeks. They started work the first week of the spring term, which was March the 30th, by uploading teamwork, uh, their teamwork PowerPoint, uh, which was their final presentation, and do initial forum posts, uh, which for the first forum, it was uh, team-based. And then they, they had the other four uh, forums that were individual work. And then students were supposed to be done with all the forum work, the initial posts and responses, the course survey, the ICAS survey, which is the Interprofessional Collaborative Competency Attainment Survey, and the course evaluation by April 22nd. So this was the plan, right? This was the ideal scenario. So just a reminder, we were dealing with over 600 students. Um, and did I skip one? I think did I skip? Uh, I think I skipped one. Did I skip one? No, I didn't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. So as feared, Sakai did have a hard time. Sorry for that. Um, did have a hard time with the volume of participants, even though the work was spread out over three weeks to make sure every participant, student and facilitator access the right forums, the, the ones assigned to them. Um, I assigned each corresponding forum to each corresponding group, so they could only see that each facilitator monitor interacted with four previously in-person groups. Um, we, we grouped two in-person groups, so each with 15 students into one online group as we had fewer facilitators. Um, most volunteer facilitators and managed two online groups, which amounted to approximately 60 students per facilitator. Toby and I also needed to facilitate to make sure we could cover all the groups. Um, one of the main issues we had was that Sakai would revert to the membership of the forums to the default one, which was the groups one and two. So, without any warning to us. All of a sudden, when students were going back to Sakai to post a response or interaction, they were doing so in a different group. So a couple of students emailed us about it and we were, we, I went back, on, back in it and the membership section and checked group by group and fixed the membership, but this happened at least twice. So also, even though we warned students about possible Sakai crashes and asked them to work in a Word document and then cut and paste uh, into the forums, um, a few of them didn't. So then they had to redo their post. So technology can help, but can also act as a barrier when most of the content is delivered online and when the course is for so many students. So, however, COVID did not only bring with it this challenge, right? So not all of the challenges we had were technology related. As you know, the first stage of the pandemic affected us all in unexpected ways and it affected each of us differently. During the COVID-19 crisis, students have had to manage their um, academic needs while quite possibly struggling at a personal level with more basic needs. So the Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a model to explain motivation. I'm, I'm sure you're uh, aware of this model. Um, this model that shows student needs has reached a, a new level of relevance uh, in these trying times for all of us and specifically for our learners. The bottom two layers, the physiological needs and the safety needs are required to move up in the hierarchy. 
love and belonging and esteem or the psychological needs, and it is at the esteem level uh, where academic achievement takes place. So notice all the levels that need to take, be taken care of first for academic achievement to take place. So for students to perform well academically, they first need to feel cared for and need a sense of belonging. Students need to experience identity and safety, to feel welcome, respected, included. The reality acknowledged to increase academic achievement. And this helps them persist through challenges and it mitigates against the impact of stereotypes. Um, so yes, COVID affected us all differently and that is due to the fact that we're all very diverse in different ways. So we wanted to clarify the definition of diversity at OGSU. The definition we use at OGSU is quite broad uh, and includes not only race and ethnicity, but also um, uh, native language, national origin, uh, sexual orientation, gender identification, religion, marital status, um, rural versus urban, um, technology comfort. Um, so um, it's, um, and we we were thinking when we when we thought of our concept of diversity at OGSU, we took uh, into account um, the definition of the Association of American Colleges and Universities that um, says diversity is composed of individual differences. Like for example, we mentioned the technology comfort of our students that those are individual differences and. Uh, and also group and social differences. Um, it is all, always important to have a clear picture of your students' backgrounds. So to access demographic information for our students, we requested that information from the registrar offices at OHSU, OSU, and OIT. Um, so understanding your student's background is important to teaching inclusively and to demonstrate care in education. In the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we mentioned that to help students feel belonging, that they belonged, it uh, was important for them to move up in the hierarchy and to get to the level of self-esteem. So as educators, we need uh, to make sure we help students feel like they belong with other people in our courses. Uh, we just discussed how feeling a sense of belonging will help students' uh, self-esteem and hence will help them progress academically. The concept of care is key to help students, regardless of where they are, whether they're K through 12 or whether they are in higher ed education. Um, develop a sense of belonging, and then achieve their highest academic potential. Geneva Gay tells us that to be a caring educator means to be an educator that expects highly, relates genuinely, and facilitates relentlessly. So to show students that we cared in our online screen term session for foundations, we expected highly of them by developing content that was equally challenging as it would have been in the in-person session. We related generally by understanding the extreme circumstances students had to face in the spring term and the isolation they were enduring. And we also facilitated relentlessly by engaging with our students via the forums and providing as much feedback as, as possible. So with the concept of culturally response care by gay in mind, I will elaborate on these concepts and how uh, we showed or tried to show our students that we cared in our online foundations course. And of course, we tried best online teaching practices um, of building a community, being personable and reachable, being compassionate and flexible, being proactive, um, being present in the online environment, making success transparent, and by providing as much feedback as we could. So how we, did we do this exactly? So we, we tried to present clear instructions in Sakai, 
we um, we did further modifications in instructions as the student asked questions. So we we did some tweaks. Um, we opened the active session to several weeks. We responded to emails uh, within 24 hours as much as it was possible. Um, we checked on students' work, um, and so we individually contacted them to remind them of work that was still needed to be completed. And, and that's what I need. Uh, I mean by being proactive, right? Of course, students have the responsibility of reaching out and, and telling us if, if, they, if they're a little bit behind, but um, in showing them that we cared, we also were proactive in, in reaching out to them as well, because we, we, we knew they were uh, performing and in the course under extreme conditions that no one has faced before. Uh, so we, we tried to be very proactive with them in helping them out a little bit. Uh, we extended deadlines. We, we had students, um, when I, we reached out to them, for example, one student was in the front lines of COVID in California and traveling back and forth between um, Oregon and California. And so on the weekend that, was, uh, that he was in town, um, that was after the deadlines, uh, of course, he responded and of course, we offered an extension to them. They were, we had many students who, um, are single parents. And so um, one woman I reached out to, she was late and she told me, I'm completely overwhelmed with my young kids. I'm a single parent. Could I please have an extension? And she, she didn't thought she, she would be allowed to have an extension. So by reaching out to her, we, we tried to be compassionate with her circumstances. Um, and of course we tried to to have a, an active facilitator presence in the forums. So that was just asked of the facilitators, but as well, Toby and I were very proactive in being there uh, and reading out the, you know, the responses and interacting with the students. We, we really tried our best. So as we were trying to be inclusive and we were concerned about showing care, we also had you know, these main concerns that we're achieving IP goals, uh, of course, being fully online, which we hadn't done before, having so many students and very few facilitators. And, and like I said, trying to be inclusive, we only had one month to prepare. Um, so how did we do? I'm gonna let Toby take it over now. All right, thank you, Graciela. So when we found ourselves in the same boat as nearly every other educational institution, rapidly converting our curriculum that had never before been online to an entirely online platform, we decided that we just couldn't pass up on the opportunity to evaluate and hopefully publish our work, to look deeper into if we really did what we set out to do. And so shameless plug, our findings that I'm going to share with you shortly um, were actually just published yesterday in the Journal of Interprofessional Care. So we're really excited about that. Um, before I kind of dive into what our findings were, just so that we're speaking the same language, um, when we refer to interprofessional education or IPE, we're referring to situations when students from two or more professions are learning about, with, and from each other to enable effective communication and improve health outcomes. On the other hand, um, interprofessional collaborative practice is when multiple health workers from different professional backgrounds work together with patients, families, communities to deliver the highest quality of patient care. So we wanted to know if what we were going to implement this big, huge, gigantic online course in this teeny tiny limited time frame um, was actually effectual, specifically looking at did interprofessional education take place? And if the students did in fact learn about interprofessional collaborative practice. Um, also, because COVID-19 was so new um, and it was affecting the students' lives in such a hugely profound way, to further enhance our students' sense of community, 
we decided that we really needed to address COVID-19 in our class. And since it is an interprofessional class, we needed to address this in terms of how COVID related to our students' future professions and also how their future professions could collaborate or could potentially collaborate to combat this newly unfolding pandemic. And we did this through the addition um, of a forum on COVID-19. So our research specifically evaluated the effect that the COVID-19 pandemic had on novice health profession students, specifically looking at students' knowledge of their own and other health professions and their value of that interprofessional collaborative practice. Next slide. So we evaluated the online course that we created by really listening to what our students had to say. Um, and we did this by a different, many different modalities. We really wanted to get a really broad picture of what the students were feeling because Graciela and I can go and look at the forums. We can think we did this really super great, awesome job and feel really good about ourselves because it was a lot of work in a short period of time. But it doesn't really mean anything unless the students were actually getting something out of it and feeling like they had a purpose. So we constructed a survey uh, to compare and contrast the two in-person sessions that we had to the online session. Um, this survey was electronically disseminated to the students and the students completed it anonymously because we really wanted to we wanted their honest opinion. We didn't want a sugar-coated version of, oh, this is so great and we love you. We really wanted to know, did it, did it do what we wanted to do? Did you learn from this? Um, and was it worth your time? Uh, we also did an in-depth thematic analysis of the COVID-19 forum, the posts uh, by the students and the responses that they had to their peers. And then we looked at the end of term evaluations. We conducted focus groups and individual interviews to um, further evaluate this conversion that we did of our course to an online platform. Next slide. So total, um, and this is a mind boggling number, uh, we had 654 students enrolled in our course. Um, and these students were all from 17 unique health professional under um, educational programs. So as you can see here um, in the chart, just under 50% of our students were from undergraduate nursing and predoctoral medicine programs, so MD students. Uh, all of our students were in the first year of their respective programs, with the exception of the pharmacy students at OSU, they were second year students. Slightly half, um, over half of our participants were between the ages of 25 and 35, with the overall age range from just under 25 to just over 45. The majority of our students were female and most of them were Caucasian. Next slide. So we wanted to kind of see how many of these students had taken online courses before. Um, so that was kind of would set a baseline. And we found that 90%, just over 90% of our students had taken some form of online course prior to their experience in this. So that was really good. We knew that at least this wasn't the very first time they'd ever taken an online course. They had had some experience before, which can really help. Um, the majority of the students indicated that they did have a preference for in-person courses as opposed to the online courses, which is really understandable given our student population, that they're all going into professions that are very, very rich in human connection. So they're going to be caring for people on a daily basis. And people that do that tend to like to be around other people. Next slide. So even though they would prefer the course to be in person and they had had two courses, um, two portions of this course in person already, so they had something to compare it to. When asked if an interprofessional collaborative practice could be taught online, all of the respondents reported that it could be. Now remember, interprofessional collaborative practice is when you have multiple healthcare workers that are from different professional backgrounds working together with patients, families, communities in order to deliver high quality patient care. And if you think about that definition and you think about online, you could imagine how completely difficult um, it, it, it is to teach something like that in an online setting because you don't really have patients that are there. You don't have this ability to interact. So that, that really says something if the students think that it can be taught online. 
Uh, next slide. And even, even better than that was that when the students were asked if they actually did learn about interprofessional collaborative practice um, this term, and we also gave the students the exact definition that we shared with you so that they, they knew exactly what it meant, uh, all of the students, 100% of them said that they did. And so this was really astounding, um, and it indicates that we did something right, which is yay for us. Um, so even though the students preferred that in-person education, all of the students did in fact learn what we had really hoped that they would be able to learn from our course. And while that's super interesting, even more interesting still, I think, is the findings that we, we, we found in our thematic analysis of the COVID-19 forum posts and responses. And next slide. So we had a lot of findings. This, this was a, a, a behemoth of a project, um, but I'm only, we're going to only talk about kind of the ones that apply to this and that really display the students' interactions and the sense of community that they had with one another. Um, but our, our findings suggest that students actually felt more comfortable speaking up in the online setting as opposed to the in-person setting. Uh, students perceive that their peers, they said things online that they wouldn't have otherwise said if they were in person. And this was just really excellent, meaning that they really felt comfortable to do this. Um, we believe that this increased transparency that, that the students had in feeling comfortable speaking up made the students feel more connected with one another. And this was evident in the many instances within the COVID-19 forum where students displayed extremely high levels of honesty and even vulnerability at times with one another. It was also supported in our survey data in that slightly over half of the students reported that their connection to other students in the course online compared to the two terms that they had in person was either somewhat or much better. So this is huge. So even though they preferred in-person learning, they actually had a greater connection to each other online. Um, another explanation for this reported increase in connection to one another is the unity that they felt um, with their future health professions banding together for the COVID-19 response. We were reading in post after post, students seemed to share the sentiment that everyone from the healthcare community um, was unifying in the response to the pandemic and banding together. Um, additionally, it appears that by having students focus on the intense and immediate global crisis that COVID-19 was and still is, uh, the students were able to construct how their various professions were coming together interprofessionally for the enhancement of their patients. Next slide. One of the other themes that we found uh, was students responding to their classmates' uh, posts with this really high degree of empathy that we hadn't seen before. Um, students were displaying an understanding and an awareness, a sensitivity, and they were demonstrating um, they, were, they demonstrated vicariously experiencing the feelings and thoughts and experiences of their fellow classmates, which was really, really rewarding to be able to see them doing. Uh, next slide. And I think uh, this, this sums it up for me, but lastly, I think even the most interesting thing that we found was the really extremely high amount of the students' responses to one another that were just really encouraging or affirming. And it was nearly 100% of the peer responses that, that displayed this sort of peer affirmation. Sometimes they were just light and positive, like, I really agree with you. But every single one of those responses was extremely supportive, and it displayed and demonstrated this climate of mutual respect and value for one another. Um, research indicates that to effectively learn, students must become a part of the culture of their future profession. And in this context, uh, when we say culture, we're referring to a shared, a set of shared, often unarticulated assumptions that permeate through action. And this culture deeply affects the social context. So in order for the students to learn, they have to really feel like they're a part of, of a culture. Um, and it, it, it's really evident through their posts and their discussions that they're starting to view themselves as a member of their future culture. Um, so in our, in our course, there are multiple cultures at play. Um, 
those of each health profession, that of health professions as a unified body or an interprofessional community. Um, and educational research indicates that the best learning takes place in these types of social situations. So I think that we were able to even broaden our, um, our definition of what diversity is in that these students are coming from very different backgrounds and different ways of providing healthcare to their patients. Um, so based on our findings, it appears that the COVID-19 pandemic while it's absolutely horrible and terrible and we've had such terrible things, there's a little bit of positive um, that comes from it. And I always like to look at the positive side of things. And it really, we were able to witness it having this tremendously unifying effect on our health profession students, um, as evidenced by the high levels of affirmation and empathy that were indicated in the student responses. Um, there were several students who directly mentioned that the interprofessional community is coming together. And the coolest thing I think is that many of the students were starting to use the pronoun we when emphasizing the need for interprofessional collaborative practice, just indicating that they themselves, even though they're first year students, already feel like they're a part of their future profession. Graciela. Yeah. Um, so, um... So yeah, so we, as Toby said, um, you know, we wanted, we needed to listen to our students to see how we were doing. And, and then we got some suggestions from them. Um, we, we were interested in, in hearing suggestions from students because given the size of a course, we already knew we would need to deliver this course fully online again in, for the full academic year of uh, 2021. And maybe this will be the reality, the new reality for this course uh, from now on, not only this coming year. So as it is now fully online, um, in, indeed actually a new remote program uh, like the La Grande Nursing Group um, will be added this coming year. So we're gonna get closer to 700, hence the title of this presentation. Uh, so, um, among the suggestions the students gave us um, in the in individual interviews, in the focus groups, um, in the course evaluations, um, there were suggestions regarding student interactions and students suggested um, ground rules. Um, and ground rules are expectations of how students should interact with each other when sharing opinions. And while the topics don't necessarily lend themselves to conflict for this course, they acknowledge that some interactions um, were not, did not seem completely respectful to everyone. And, and so having ground rules in place would help prevent those um, uh, interactions. So they mentioned that uh, having each group create a code of conduct or a list of rules of engagement has helped them in the past and in other classes. So, so that's a great suggestion to, uh, uh, to, to keep in mind. Um, the importance of having uh, group rules as students do together um, kind of be undermined. And they even suggested language they said, for example, assume best intentions, share as much or as little as you feel comfortable. What is said here stays here, which was very interesting. They suggested these uh, students are afraid of typing ideas when those could be cataloged and, and then um, forwarded to other people. So, um, so that was interesting uh, to know that that's part of their concern. Um, we thought we could ask also for a scriber volunteer student for each group where they could write up the final list for the group and post in the forum so they can refer back to that list at a later time um, in the case of a conflict, for example. Um, regarding an inter uh, interpersonal relationships, they suggested that we could have students share more about each other's profession. Uh, professions and to more clearly acknowledge students' personal situations, especially now during COVID-19. Um, for the first assignment, students suggested uh, we, could, uh, we could ask them to set up a video call among themselves to meet uh, their teams or even the whole group and to get to know each other via a video uh, for, for example, 30 minutes. Um, just to create a dialogue and that sense of community or learning community 
And this could be done for every term as well. Uh, so for every few assignments. Um, the first one could be for them to get to know each other and then the rest could be sort of a checking call for the team. Um, I personally found this particular suggestion of online name tags very interesting. Um, they said they could um, consider that each, we could consider that each student writes um, their degree after each post, their preferred name and their degree uh, in place of the name tags that we use in the in-person sessions. And, um, and so they mentioned that that would help the interactions in the forums. And so basically they need more support so they understand each other's programs and roles and professions and and they will help them uh, engage in the forum discussions. Um, regarding the setup of the course, um, they did ask for even more simplified instructions. So even uh, a student interview yesterday said that mu multiple emails with the same but edited information could I felt overwhelming at times and that, um, that due to COVID, their bandwidth um, was much lower than as faculty thought it was. Um, they also mentioned that we could use students to help us TAs. Uh, the idea of students as facilitators is important and appealing to us because we do, we do need so many facilitators and not all faculty really understand online instruction. That was another challenge that we also had in the spring. So um, former students of this course um, that we could use as TAs uh, not only have taken the course already and understand it, but also have an understanding of what students need uh, for an online course. So that would be very valuable. We already have two student volunteers uh, so far. And one way we think we could do this um, and have them involved would be to have them rotate terms as they may not be as available as they think they are or they will be this coming year. Um, regarding uh, facilitator introductions, um, this came in directly as a suggestion uh, from students' uh, comments uh, in the course, uh, course evaluations. As, as we were going through the course evaluations for this course, we realized that they did not always knew who was their online instructor, uh, which was interesting. Um, I will read some comments uh, in the course evaluations, uh, you know, comments from students for one group so that you see the different comments. Uh, all of these comments were about one facilitator. So some of the comments were, I don't know who this facilitator was as it was online. I can't remember this instructor. I literally had no contact with her, LOL. Major props to Christine. Uh, I can't believe she was able to review and reply to every post. I don't know who this person is. Led the class really well. So we need to work more on that, on that the students being aware of who the facilitator is and introducing them. So we'll need to work on that, obviously. Um, as students mentioned how they knew some of their student colleagues uh, faced um, many challenges, the idea of the basic needs statement surfaced. Um, so they said that more acknowledgement to what students went through during COVID is important and if possible they would like more conversations about that. So given that the COVID crisis is longer than we thought initially that it would be, this is still going to be relevant for 2021 academic year, we think. Um, regarding types of activities, they suggested that we allowed some uh, video posts and audio um, uh, so that it's not all in writing. So what they suggested here is an example of different ways of engagement with the content and it could be done by having them record their response to a reading and upload it to the forum, for example. So we will not only be asking them to write their responses. So uh, we to just keep in mind that usually courses online rely heavily on written assignments. And if this cannot be avoided, we should at least um, try to be flexible with grammar standards as we may have international students whose first language is not English 
or students who just simply may not be strong writers. So again, individual differences within the diversity spectrum we mentioned before. Um, some, some students also um, suggested running forms was, um, that was, that was one that caught our attention, at least to have one in the year or one per term. So this could be four to six questions for students to respond and interact um, uh, with throughout the entire term to keep them going, right? So students will interact every week or every other week with these topics or questions. Um, and ways to, to do it could be uh, to have them share an experience they had that week or share a reading they came across or ask a thoughtful question. If, you know, things, th those were some of the ways uh, in which we were thinking they could interact with this running forum. And so it's always interesting to see how students made suggestions about how to further push students for more engagement in the course. And yes, they prefer synchronous interactions, but for this big course, we can't provide at this time that kind of real-time interaction. But just having this feedback is helpful to understand what students need and hope for and how we can do tweaks to get close to, to that as much as we can. We also found it interesting that they mentioned that we could set up a culture of engagement. So that is, if faculty remain engaged and are proactive in requesting that students actively engage in the forums, then students won't check out, they said. So they will remain engaged and hence a culture of engagement will be successfully established for this course. Um, so we thought of some of the actions we could take, we could take taking into account student suggestions. We, we kind of implement them all at this time. Um, but we, we know we can take some small steps towards making our foundations course online as inclusive as possible. So additionally, the chair of the IP committee, the director Toby and me, we met to brainstorm on diversity, equity and inclusion elements for foundations. So these are the actions um, that are a combination of student suggestions and our own brainstorming as a team. Um, so on the syllabus, We've included um, inclusion and in, inclusion and diversity statement and a basic needs uh, statement. We uh, will be doing a midterm survey as a check-in uh, tool. Uh, we'll do perhaps as a survey some sort of uh, reporting. We'll set up some sort of reporting mechanism in case there's any issues or challenges in interpersonal communications among the students. Uh, and in terms of content, we'll, we'll be sure to include elements of anti-racism and inclusion in case studies and or discussion forum prompts. Um, so to continue to listen, so part, part of what our next step is to continue to listen to our students and continue to improve our inclusive practices online. Uh, and to do so, we will analyze longitudinal data and has continue to have an open channel of communication with students via surveys, interviews, and perhaps future focus groups. Um, so yeah, our, our key element here is to continue to listen to the students and analyze how we improve over time. Um, so now, because, because we know everyone is on their own challenging path to inclusive and caring online teaching, and we all need to think and plan strategically what even if small steps we can take, we would like to give you a couple of minutes uh, to reflect and share with us one thing you have learned today that you would like to add to your online courses in the future or to suggest to the faculty you work with. Um, and we're also taking this moment to do this because we, we think we could all benefit from each other's ideas and thoughts. So we will allow one minute for reflection. So then please start. And then after that, you'll start sharing the chat, we hope. Um, but uh, when you do so, be sure to, uh, to share with all panelists and attendees so we can all see your chat. But, but please, we'll ask you to first Reflect on your own during one minute. I'm gonna time us. So think 
for one minute, one thing you have learned today and you'd like to add in your online courses in the future and think if you expect any barriers or challenges uh, when trying to, to, to implement these and what strategies you could use to, to overcome them. Okay, so I'm going to start the one minute for reflection. So we're going to have one minute of silence and I'll let you know when that minute is over and so you can start sharing in the chat. Ten more seconds, We're almost done. Okay, that's our minute. So now, uh, please start sharing in the chat your reflections. Could be to all three questions or only one, whatever you feel comfortable with sharing. Please remember to share. Um, or in the all, all panelists and attendees, so we can all see it. Uh, will you share? Yeah, I encourage instructors to ask questions to ask students. I'm sorry, I made that one it's a little bit higher. Needs to be bigger. Hold on. Um, can instructors to ask uh, students what suggestions they have? Yeah, and do this before the class has ended. Yeah, um, yeah, Amy, I'm, I'm reading your post now. Yeah, that, that would be great. It's always good to have the students in mind um, and, and ask them to, to help us, right, develop content and it helps them to buy in, I think, to the content as well, because they're helping to create, create part of it. It's a wonderful idea. Yes. Um, yeah, the ground rules, um, uh, Dawn is saying that she would like to implement that. I think that's um, sometimes we forget about it. And sometimes in in-person courses, it comes more uh, sort of organically. But in online courses, you all know, you will have so much experience in online education. We have to be more intentional and just and remember to do that as well. Um, we'll have them consider who they want us to be, um, who they want us to be a community. And yeah, and what they expect and not accept. Yes, that's great. I like that. We could, we could think of that, Toby, as well. Mm -hmm. we give them I think so the too. For the brown rules. Yeah, it's great. Yes, you should be optimistic, Don. Oh, well, do you have the, um, Katrina is asking for the link to the paper. Could you share? Yeah, I'm just not sure how to leave Zoom and get the link and come back. <laughs> I'll try. I'm going to see if I can, I can fish it. I think I had it open. Or For a millennial, I don't do too good with technology. <laughs> I'm gonna, ah, okay, I'll, well, hold on. we'll share. Yeah. If you have trouble okay. finding okay. it right now, you can always send it to me um, after the session and I can share it out to everybody who is here. You know what, wait, wait, I will email it to you on my other computer and then okay. I'll let you post it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> That's that. we'll, we'll share, Katrina, we'll share. Um, reading apprenticeship has a great norms grading class. Okay, we'll look at that. Uh, Sherry, is that something you can share with us? Is that something that's online, Sherry? And feel free to unmute yourself if you want to tell us more about that one. I'm not sure. Um, I think, um, 
Sherry, if you could, if you wanted to unmute yourself, feel free and share a little bit more about that. About um, your I, I think they have to raise their hands first and oh. then we will need to unmute. Sherry, raise your hand if you want to. I'm, I'm trying to get her, um, I've asked to unmute her. Or if it's easier, you can just copy and paste in the chat. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but I, I'm intrigued, Sherry, by your um, your suggestion, and I would like to know more. Um, yeah, Octaviano, I think also I agree. Doing the audio video responses, we we hadn't thought of that really. Although that uh, we know it's good practice to include mm -hmm. all different learning styles of our students. And indeed, the students did remind us that that was something that they would really appreciate, having different formats and different ways of engaging with uh, content and engagement, you know, different engagement in the class. Uh, so we'll, for sure, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll try to do that. That would be great to do, for sure. Um, oh, okay. Thank, thank you, Sherry. Thanks. Whenever you get the chance, it will be good to have it if you could email it to Weiwei and then we can, and she can share with all of us. Um, yeah, I think the audio or video is always good. Um, if, if you can do that in Canvas, that's great. Um, I know there's some limitations. There are many tools that you can use for that, like even VoiceThread that I've used at other institutions where I've worked. That works really well, and, and it, 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 it's easier to do different, you know, formats of engagement, writing, audio, video. Um, if you're using you app-based computers, um, Flipgrid is also a really good one for students to share a little video of them talking and then respond to each other. Yeah, that's great. Um, I don't know if there's anything else or um, we're ready to move to the Q&A. Thank you so much for the suggestions. We really appreciate all the comments. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to, um, we don't, I don't see any other suggestions on the chat for these. So let's move to Q&A. You can, you can post that. Um, let's see. We do have a specific Q&A. So if you wanted to share so this is Velda. I have some questions. Um, you've mentioned students in the medical field really prefer in-person education. We're wondering if there are any challenges you faced in content delivery. For example, if there's content that requires very hand strong hands-on instruction, such as labs, how did you handle that? So yes, that, that is a, that's a huge issue for the medical profession. Um, I can speak to that personally because I'm a dental teacher um, and teaching students to be dentists online doesn't work. Um, but for our particular course, um, it's for first year students and none of it is really hands-on. It's all theoretical. Um, students are learning about patient safety and ways that they can speak up and communicate with, with each other. So our particular content really lends itself well to be put online. Um, we'd actually wanted to do it for a while, but no one ever really wanted to let us. So this was a good sort of soft launch into moving the course online. <laughs> I love it. Okay, another question. Um, you mentioned the sense of community in the discussion forums. Did the students utilize any other tools for communication that helped with that sense of community? That's a great question. Um, I would assume so. Uh, but I can't tell you 100% for sure. I know the students were all placed into smaller sort of learning communities, smaller groups where they worked together on projects. And they did contact each other outside of Sakai, outside of our learning platform. Whether they did that via text message, via FaceTime or Skype, or even via, a lot of them like to use Google Docs. Um, huh. So I'm not sure. Google Docs seems to be the fallback for most of them. Um, but yeah, they did have communication outside of just our, our LMS. Okay, um, what questions would you ask in the running forums? Were those questions to be support for the students or to infuse more learning with the subject matter? Um, 
I don't I, I mean Toby can take over this too if she wants to and, and Toby as a director she really develops the, the content for this course um, and she's a clinician author too. Uh, I would say probably content would be to develop more uh, awareness with the content uh, and or maybe also about communication and teamwork uh, uh, that comes from that interprofessional you know interaction that they will have so I think that, that that would be that would be interesting to see in a running forum and how their perception of teamwork develops throughout the year. I think also I, I would love to see how that running forum, if we indeed can uh, put it in place, which is uh, the plan. I think uh, would be interesting to see how they they grow uh, throughout the year since it's such mm -hmm. a long course because it's a full year. So. It's something we could see how they improve from the beginning to the end. Right. I think it's interesting that, that they wanted that. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> okay. How did you handle disrespectful behavior in post? Did you have ground rules shared at the beginning of the class? And did you involve the facilitators in creating ground rules? So we did not have ground rules and we, as Graciela mentioned earlier, that that's something that we, we are going to implement um, as we move forward. Thankfully, there was, obviously with 700, almost 700 students, we didn't read every single post. We let facilitators read through them, but in the groups that I was assigned to, I only saw one disrespectful post and it was towards me and not towards another student. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I just addressed it. <laughs> so we use Netiquette. If you search it online, there's a really good uh, website that shows Netiquette that gives you know the rules of how you're supposed to communicate. So you don't have to create it from scratch. It's a great idea. Uh, yeah, yeah. Would you, would you share Velda with us in the chat if you can? Okay. Okay, if you take a long time on this next question, I'll do that. <laughs> Who are the 100 plus facilitators, later 12, and did you have any training for your facilitators? Yeah, that's a good question. So the facilitators for this course, uh, they're all uh, faculty at OHSU, OSU, and OIT. So, um, and they're all volunteers. They, this is, just a, sort of a service they do to their institutions by helping us facilitate this course. So this year we send them an email and said, I mean, for the spring, um, we'll do it online. We understand if you no longer, because they go through a process where they sign up to facilitate and they say if they'll do one session or two or three, right? So one term or two or three. And they pretty much all uh, fled <laughs> after that email, we'll do it online, who wants to help us? And everybody was gone, no response, except for these 12. So we're really grateful that they, despite the uncertainty of how we would be able to do it, that they decided to help us. Um, did I respond to the question, Toby? Yeah, you did. I mean, the, in, initially when the course started back in, I think, 2012, um, the goal was to have all the facilitators be clinicians um, so that students could get this sort of wealth of knowledge from different professions working together. But clinicians tend to be busy being clinicians and <laughs> right. <laughs> we never really get as many as we want. So we've opened it up to um, a lot of our other faculty, um, our librarians, our teaching and learning faculty. And I personally think that we get a huge, rich amount of information um, from our non-clinician faculty as well. So the majority of ones that decided that they'd volunteer um, for our super awesome online experience this spring term were, I believe, in fact, the non-clinician faculty, and they, they were amazing. Oh, wow. We've done it without them. Wow. Okay. And we so need wait, wait, are we getting to word time? Yeah, we, we're almost a minute away. I forgot to mention, we did have some a sort of a practice session with them though before. Mm -hmm. and, and now we know how to do it better because then we did that, we saw them in action, and now we know exactly what we need to do differently in that training session with them, so. Great, thank you so much. Well, we are at the hour. Thanks very much, Graciela and Toby. Large enrollment classes definitely have their own challenges. So thanks very much for sharing your experience and tips with us. Um, 
we are going to close the webinar now, but if you have any questions, please feel free to um, reach out and we, we look forward to seeing you in our September sessions. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye.